Welcome. We're so blessed to have you with us this morning. Won't you please join us for worship? God, I'm running for your heart. I'm running for your heart. Till I am a soul on fire Lord, I'm longing for your ways Waiting for the day When I am a soul on fire Till I am a soul on fire God, I'm running for your heart I'm running for your heart Till I am a soul on fire Lord, I'm longing for your ways I'm waiting for the day When I am a soul on fire Till I am a soul on fire Lord, restore the joy I had I have wondered, bring me back In this darkness, lead me through Until all I see Waiting for the day when I am a soul on fire. Till I am a soul on fire. Lord, let me burn for you again. Lord, let me burn for you again. Let me return to you again. Let me return to you again. Lord, let me burn for you again. Let me return to you again. God, I'm running for your heart. I'm running for your heart. Till I am a soul on fire. Lord, I'm longing for your ways. I'm waiting for the day when I am a soul on fire. God, I'm running for your heart. I'm running for your heart. Till I am a soul on fire, Lord. Till I am a soul on fire, Lord. Till I am a soul on fire. Amen. Please join me in praying the Wesley Covenant Prayer. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O wonderful and holy God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, you are mine, and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. Amen. This month, the month of October, we're preaching a series about uh, John Wesley. We call it Wesley's Greatest Hits. At the end of his life, he wrote a little treatise called Thoughts Upon Methodism, and he starts that out by saying, I'm not afraid that Methodists will ever cease to exist, but only that they would exist as a dead sect, having the form of religion, but no power. He goes on to say, to get that power, you have to uphold your, the doctrine, the spirit, and the discipline of the faith. So in October, we're going to look at some of the things he believed created that doctrine, spirit, and discipline. In other words, we're going to talk about who we are. We're going to, this morning, talk about his quote, submitting to be more vile. Next week, it's about accountable discipleship. The week after that, 
Uh, we're talking about his views on schism, which is an old-fashioned word meaning to, to split into factions. And then we're going to finish it up at the end of October talking about his position on elections, on politics, as we go up toward the presidential election in our country. Then after All Saints Day in November, we're going to talk about where we're going and look at some of the contemporary issues in United Methodism. I would say that you need to uh, be prepared. This sermon we're gonna preach this morning talks about our need to step out of our comfort zone. And boy, let me tell you, for some of you, the next two months might be, and even for me, the next two months might be challenging. But this is our role as preachers of the gospel to present to us the word of Christ, the word of God for our day. So I, we hope you enjoy these two series coming up. For some of you, this looks entirely normal. A preacher in a robe. But if you were to back up and see the blue jeans and tennis shoes that I have on, you might be, you might pause. Back in the 90s when I was at First Methodist, it was a Wednesday night. We had supper and after that, we we're gonna have an Ash Wednesday service. So I was the youth pastor. I was dressed like I normally dressed, blue jeans, tennis shoes, and man, they were great tennis shoes. They were those Bo Jackson Nikes, you know, with the orange and the purple. Man, they were great. I loved them. So after supper, I walk into the office, put on my robe, get ready to walk into the worship service, and the senior pastor says, where are you going like that? So I'm going to worship. He says, no, you're not, not wearing that. If you want to worship, you go home and you change. Well... I was furious. I drove Whitesburg like, like NASCAR to get home and change all the while angry. I came back and I got in worship and my part had already passed. Jim Berry, who some of you may know, Jim Berry did my part in the worship service. Now, what's the rule about Hawaiian shirts after Labor Day? I don't know, but I know who would. My mother, my mother had Emily Post memorized. She had the etiquette book, big old thick etiquette book. She would know. Everybody has a different level of vile or unacceptable. My senior pastor at First Methodist had one level. I had another. My mother would have even a, 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 a tighter, tighter definition. During all these last seven, eight months, we've done a lot of stuff that we formerly considered unacceptable, uh, unpleasant. Honestly, I'll be honest with you, uh, like online communion. What, the first one we did was what, like June? And we had struggles and discussions. Is this proper? Is this going too far? What is it about communion that's all important? And, and then, but finally we decided it was more important to share uh, the sacrament with all of you in any way possible. So we submitted to be more vile. And that's what John Wesley called it. The word vile, I know y'all think uh, the dictionary says morally reprehensible. But Wesley was using a different, a different definition as one that, that I'm using here. It's it's just unpleasant. Um, little worth, no account, Webster says. Uh, so the things that Wesley submitted to be more vile and do were just worthless. In his uh, context, they were considered no no account. This is what he says on April second, seventeen thirty nine, at four in the afternoon. I submitted to be more vile and proclaimed in the highways the glad tidings of salvation. Speaking from a little eminence in a ground adjoining to the city to about 3,000 people. I've never preached to 3,000 people. Standing on a little hill, a little eminence, he preached to 3,000 people. And that for him was previously 
unacceptable. Later, it had repercussions. He was going to go preach somewhere, and he got a letter that said, our minister, having been informed, you're beside yourself. In other words, our minister thinks you're crazy. He does not care that you should preach in any of his churches. In other words, you're too unacceptable for me. That was significant. For Wesley, growing up in an Anglican church with a priest for a father, in Oxford, educated, professor, proper, rules, high church, cathedral, gothic, stone, you just didn't go out to a little hill out on the roadside and preach. We do a lot of things like online communion that might make even Wesley roll over in his grave. But maybe not. Think about it. If you're a, a if you if you're astute there and you heard that date, you might know it sounds a little just a little after his Aldersgate experience, May 24, 1738. A little less than a year later, he'd submitted to be more vile. That Aldersgate experience was when he realized that Jesus's sacrifice, Jesus's forgiveness, was for him, not the books, not the brain, but for his heart. And he had to have that passion to go out and be more vile. So submitting to be more vile is just meaning that you step out of your comfort zone. Like I stepped out of Bill Bostick's comfort zone. Like I would be way past my mother's comfort zone right now on October 1st wearing a Hawaiian shirt. But you know, Wesley got that from Jesus. Jesus did that. Jesus, in the, the, the context of his day, nearly everything he did was unacceptable to the establishment. It included the company that he chose to keep. Mark 2, I've got a couple of stories from Mark 2, where the first one is where Jesus gathers a bunch of people, including, including tax collectors. Oh my goodness. Whew. tax collectors and sinners, and they complain about it. And Jesus says, healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick people do. The message says it this way, who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? I'm here inviting the sin sick, not the spiritually fit. That's a key to becoming more vile and stepping outside of your comfort zone, realizing that there are people outside that comfort zone that need the good news. The second story comes later in the or uh, later in the chapter, when Jesus and his disciples are walking through a field of grain. This is Mark two. It ends at Mark two twenty seven. Um, Jesus, they're walking through a field of grain. They're picking off uh, wheat heads of wheat and and eating them. And and the Pharisees complain about them doing labor on the Sabbath because that was work. They're harvesting wheat. Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. Once again, the message, the Sabbath was made to serve us. We weren't made to serve the Sabbath. The son of man, Jesus, is no lackey to the Sabbath. He's in charge. Jesus stepped outside his world's, his religion's comfort zone to meet people. Jesus did not hold the rules to be uh, uh, the end, the most important. He broke them when he thought it would enable him to get his message and his ministry out. Jesus ate with people outside the comfort zone. He did things actions outside the comfort zone. Have you ever read the Sermon on the Mount? I mean, the whole fifth chapter is a, is a dissertation about comfort zone. You have heard it said, but I say to you. On everything like adultery, uh, lying, hatred, love, yeah, everything. You have heard it said, or it used to be like this, but I'm going to tell you, you need to go a little farther. You need to do something that's not as comfortable, that's more challenging. We've all got a comfort zone. 
I mean, I stepped outside of mine on March uh, 22nd on that first online worship service. I could not conceive of a way to have church when we weren't together at least weekly. We've all got comfort zones. Is it what we wear? Is it the words we say in worship? Is it the music we sing? Is it uh, the time of day or the day of the week that worship occurs? We've all got comfort zones. But we all, as we enter this time, uh, this month, and, and this new phase of ministry, have to be willing to step outside those comfort zones, to be more vile. Risk being unaccepted. Risk being seen of little worth. Brian Erickson is a Methodist pastor in Homewood, Alabama, Trinity United Methodist Church, and he wrote an article for a, a website called Ministry Matters. He talks about being vile, and he says, timid preaching, whose only goal is congregational coddling, isn't enough anymore. In the shadow of that Oxford professor, may the people called Methodists reclaim our vile reputation for being willing to preach where the people are. And I would add, no matter where they are, no matter how we must speak the gospel, no matter what the, the trappings of the, the service is, we must submit to be more let's do that let's be brave let's go out there and get uncomfortable amen Emptied himself of all but love and 
Tim. I'm one of the pastors here at Alders Gate. Today is World Communion Sunday. What that means simply is that we try to join our hearts and our minds and our voices with Christians around the world on this day. Even though it's a little different, we know this uh, as you are participating in this communion experience at home. Uh, we still have a decorated altar and we have a beautiful one in the main sanctuary as well. We welcome you to this time and if you will go ahead and make sure that your communion elements are ready. If you stopped by the church and grabbed one of these small communion element packets, uh, just remember in a moment, when we get to the time of communion, you'll tear off the top clear one first, which will reveal the bread, and then you'll tear off, tear off the, the under layer silver color, and that will uh, reveal the juice for you. And when we come time for communion, uh, you'll just simply partake with those elements. Hear this reading. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, that we give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You have made us one from every nation and people who live on all the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn. If you will, the words will be on your screen. Join with me. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, that by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, you delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. He commissioned us to be the witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. And today, his family and all the world is joining at his holy table. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, he said, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Again, say with me the words on your screen. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, gathered where we may be in our homes or together in this space. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts of bread and of wine, simple as they may be. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ that is redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with your church throughout the world. Strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully to your name. So by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we will feast at the heavenly banquet. If you will now, Go ahead and make sure you have your communion elements ready and together we will partake. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the cup of Christ poured out for you. response then is simply thanks be to God. 